Hi, everyone. Jeff here, co-host of the podcast you're about to listen to. So unfortunately, technology betrays us all sometimes. And in the case of today's episode and next week's episode, you're going to hear a level of audio quality that I would say is bad. It's just bad. The primary audio file for my voice was corrupted at some point in the processing, and I had to rely on my backup audio file, which is just my microphone from my laptop. So please forgive this episode's poor audio quality. Hunter sounds great as usual, of course, but I sound like a weird robot. I've done my best to make it as audible as possible, and it is remarkably still listenable, but it is noticeably worse than it should be. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the episode for its subject, but I am doubly bummed because this was such a fun episode. Ah. All right, here we go. Let's talk about golf. Hunter, have you ever have you ever played golf? I've played golf uh, a couple times, and this is a, a while back. I was living in San Francisco. There's a number of golf courses there, and I had a friend who bought a used uh, set of clubs and an old bag, and we just went out and we there were nine hole courses, and uh, we had a little fun. Yeah, yeah. So a little bit, a little bit of fun. And when you were playing golf. Did you happen to use a vehicle that would get you around the golf course? No, we schlepped our no? own stuff. Yeah, so there was no there was no golf cart involved. No golf cart involved. So that, that kind of threw off my setup here, but that's okay. <laughs> um, for people who are, are just tuning into the episode, we are uh, we're not actually going to talk about golf all that much. I think there is a larger episode at some point to talk about golf, the sport at large, and particularly maybe some of the land uses that go with golf. We can come back to that would be a good one. It, definitely. In fact, in some ways, it's kind of weird that we're starting where we are today with this. Um, but we're going to start by talking about the golf cart, which, uh, as I was trying to set up, Hunter, which is that little vehicle that you typically see associated with golf, uh, the, the, the sport, to get people from the various holes, right? So if you have a nine-hole course, you said you schlepped it around. I've never played golf myself. But uh-huh. I've seen how big those golf courses are. are. So you're probably yeah. walking quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this was a smaller course, but, and, you know, we were young and spry and everything. But, you know, not every, you know, people are limited in certain ways. A lot of people uh-huh. love to play golf. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people aren't able to, you know, carry a bag or even pull one around. And so this makes it, you know, this opens it up a little bit for, for more, more people to participate. Absolutely. So, but we're not gonna actually going to talk about the sport at all. We'll, we'll talk a little about the sport, but really what we're going to talk about is golf carts as a method of transportation. So that's right. Generally, as we think about the golf carts, we think about them as transporting people around the golf course. However, because I'm such a transportation nerd and I love thinking about all things transportation, I especially love when I get to talk about getting people out of their single occupancy vehicles and into really anything else. We're going to use this as a fun example to see how potentially golf carts could be used to actually transport people for their everyday lives. And I think the one thing that I really want to impart just as we sort of launch into our episode today is that golf carts are really kind of genius in their utility. Um, We'll get into the definition of them, but if you just think about it briefly, um, I think hopefully most people who are listening to this know broadly what a golf cart looks like, or at least they have an image of one. Uh, If you don't, you know, go, go Google it, but you can kind of see how useful they would be, right? It's, it's a, Four-wheeled vehicle. They're basically like little mini cars. And they're very they don't take up that much space, right? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. They don't take up that much space. They don't take that much energy. We're gonna get to all this in the episode. Uh as compared to a you know, gas car, or even I would say, are you an electric car? Which, you know, again, that's probably a future episode. Uh I would say they are far more efficient. In fact, the stats actually do show that they are very very much more efficient. In basically every category. So we're going to talk a lot about golf carts today. We're going to talk a lot about them within the context of transportation and not so much with golf. So with that said, let's get into a little bit of what actually is a golf cart, because there could be a lot of different ideas of what that means, because obviously anybody can use any sort of vehicle to transport themselves around a golf course. That doesn't necessarily make it a golf cart. Right. Although I'm not sure that's, it's, that's completely allowed, but yeah, there is yeah. a standard, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I actually don't know what's allowed or what, what's not allowed, but well, I th- the reason why I bring that up is because, and maybe this is fun because of spinning out of the golf cart, sort of what it, what it has become. You now see these vehicles that are 
golf cart like, but really more off road vehicles. Right. Um, and there's also, you know, a whole classification of off road vehicles, uh, all terrain vehicles, ATVs, all these kinds of things that sort of make up this large catch all of other vehicles that are used in all kinds of different sort of transportation, right? Uh, not to get too off, off tangent, but just talking about the ATV a little bit, having worked up on uh, the transportation plans up in Alaska, I know that is something that they have to factor into their transportation system is people riding their ATVs down the highway and sort of how does that work within that context, right? Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about what a golf cart, what a golf cart actually is. So historically, it, again, going back uh, a long time ago, about 100 years ago, it, it really was any vehicle that was used to transport golfers around a large golf course while carrying basically two people and their respective equipment. And we'll talk a little bit more about the history of golf carts in a bit, but generally, just to give people some some idea of what what, what classifies as a golf cart today, generally uh, it would be a cart that is either gas or electric, but more often than not, they're electric, which is great. Mm -hmm. They typically cost around ten thousand dollars, give or take a few thousand. Some can be found for under five thousand, though I'm not really sure what the quality is. It seems like the well-known brands that I could find in the U.S. probably have around ten thousand dollars, so they're pretty so not, cheap. Not, not, I mean, it's not, not everything's relative, right? Yeah. So, I mean, compared to what cars cost today, that's kind of cheap. But compared to what car, cars used to cost, they used to be able to get a new car for that too. So right? that's true. Yeah. yeah. No, that's true. I actually have I, I have memories of uh, boy, what was it? it was some sort of Kia from the mid two thousands that was like nine thousand dollars, brand new. Yeah, not too long ago. Not too long ago, yeah. So you're right, yeah. So this this isn't this isn't inexpensive, right? right. It's still an investment. Again, and you know, I saw I saw some that cost up to twenty thousand. Um, I'm sure you could spend more if you wanted to. Yeah, right? I'm, I, I yeah. have no idea what all goes into that. I start to think about sort of what's the what kind of things are being added onto that to actually make it. Like, are there well, there's a whole industry in sort of you know blinging these things out and you know paint painting them up in certain ways, getting them to look like classic cars, all of this kind of thing. So there's a whole industry around. Yeah. So, but, but generally you could find one for far less if you really wanted to. Uh, generally, these vehicles, they weigh uh, anywhere from 500 to 1,100 pounds. So that is uh, pretty light, all things considered. If we take the average weight of a car as of 2018, this is from the U.S. Department of Transportation, the average car was 4,100 pounds. So that would include all of your, you know, Smaller cars as well as SUVs and trucks. Right. Obviously, your it's, SUVs and trucks. It's will those be big vehicles that are bringing that average up. Because I bet if we looked twenty years ago, it would be less. But, but yes. yeah, yeah, much lighter. In fact, when I was doing this research, and I don't actually have it in my notes, but just recalling from memory, when I was doing my research, I did see that as of uh, the late nineteen nineties and two thousands, the average weight of a sort of personal car, not including the trucks, was somewhere around twenty five hundred. Right. Um, that sounds so. about right. Significantly uh, lighter. Uh, we know for a fact that cars today have gotten bigger and they've gotten heavier, basically in all categories. The golf carts uh, will typically travel only up to twenty miles per hour, so they're not fast. They're right. Actually, some some small. of them hit twenty five. I think um, I want to yep. say, yeah, some can but, hit twenty five. Yep. In fact, that's, and that's a distinction too between different kinds of vehicles and stuff. But you know, that's right. That's not highway speed. That's not. <laughs> Um, I should hope not. Uh, if you're if you're thinking about taking your golf cart on the highway, maybe <laughs> maybe rethink that, <laughs> that yeah. as a possibility. No, I think to your point, yes, they they can go up to twenty five. They honestly, they, they some might even get even higher than that. What I think really drives the twenty mile per hour. What what I got from this the list that I found was regulations by state. It seems like a lot of states do cap it either at twenty. I think California is at twenty five. Or maybe 24 miles per hour can't hit 25. Mm -hmm. And then oftentimes, uh, and this is kind of an important distinction to make as we're talking about other uh, modes of transportation that aren't cars. But oftentimes, golf carts will have a roof over their head, which will provide protection from the sun or weather, rain, that kind of stuff. In fact, some even have sort of more shielding around them to further protect from the elements. And the reason why I thought that distinction was important is because as we talk about the golf cart today, there's going to be sort of comparisons made to other sort of methods of transportation, primarily probably the bicycle or the electric bike, uh, which is, again, those are, that's another episode that, that we absolutely will, will do. Absolutely. Something. But 
just in thinking about why somebody might prefer a golf cart to a bicycle, well, it could potentially be just the, the sort of protection, the additional protection from these elements that a golf cart is able to provide that's really is much more challenging in uh, a vehicle like a bike, bicycle. So that's really what golf carts are. Uh, they're, they're, otherwise they're just sort of small, smaller vehicles. Let's sort of jump into some history to sort of talk about how they maybe uh, evolved over the years to sort of get to where we are today because everything sort of has a beginning. And I'm going to preface this by just saying the history of the golf cart is wacky. Uh, to say the very least, they nobody as as far as I could find, and I, I I went down some rabbit holes. Nobody has done like a true, for a deep dive, investigative research into the history of the golf cart, where where its origins were, what the stories were behind that. I'm sure there there are people who've done bits and pieces here. In fact, as I was doing a lot of my research, Hunter, I would come a lot of different stories around the history of the golf cart from basically different golf cart dealerships. Uh, and while those were sometimes very fun and enter entertaining to read, I have no idea if any of that. Right. That seems true. like could be kind of folklore <laughs> a little bit, right? A little folklore, uh, a little, you know, obviously these places are businesses, right? They have a, a vested interest in, you know, sort of making a fun, entertaining story. So you just don't, you don't know. That said, we will get into maybe some origins and try and do a little bit of justice to the golf cart. Just know that this this podcast is not going to be an exhaustive history of the golf cart. Either. <laughs> <laughs> we just couldn't we just couldn't pull that together. Unfortunately, I really want I really wanted to have a really fun history of of the golf cart, but it is what it is. So let's talk before we get to the history of the golf cart. Was just very quickly just a smidge touch on the history of golf because you really can't separate the origins of the golf cart from the sport that we know. And so golf as a sport, sort of broadly what we know today is largely assumed to have come from the country of Scotland. Right. I mean, there's so, all kinds of games. If we go through history, there's all kinds of games that resemble golf because the idea of taking a stick and hitting a ball into a hole, I mean, that's probably come up in lots of different civilizations. Um, apparently if you go back to the 12th to 14th century, there's games that resemble golf in China, a mm -hmm. uh, game in the Netherlands that dates back to the 13th century, which is kind of mm -hmm. like golf. But then, as you said, we generally associate Scotland and the, and the origin of golf. And apparently golf has been played at St. Andrews, Scotland since 1552. At one point it was banned along with football, along with, you know, what we call what we, you and I call soccer, but yeah. what people call football. <laughs> And so, you know, these games sometimes generated distrust among the uh, the ruling class. Um, golf is codified in 1744 for the first time uh, in Edinburgh, but then the rules consolidated and standardized in 1899. So a yeah, little bit that all about, tracks, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, to your point about a sport could potentially having various origins because it's the base idea is very simple, mm. right? I think the other, the other sport to sort of a, provides a really good comparison is soccer, which you already sort of right. brought up. Right. Which again, right, you know, soccer as we know it today, football as we know it today, sort of has its origins basically around the same time. Yeah, sort of 1863 is when soccer right. gets first codified, and it's not exactly like it is today, but close enough. But then for yeah. hundreds of years before that, people are playing things that are yeah. sort of like it. Because it's because it's so basic, right? It's right. it's a ball and in the you know in the case of golf it's a hole in the ground. In the case of soccer, it's a you know a net or a, an end point, right? It, it, it's not hard to imagine how these things might have various origins in multiple different places at multiple right. different times, uh, completely independent, independent of each other. So, just, so we, but yeah, so the, the modern sport that we know sort of got started in Scotland, and this was happening during a time of industrialization. It was happening during a time of increasing uh, mechanization, all this fun stuff. In yep. fact, you know, it wasn't shortly long thereafter that sort of vehicles, you know, powered vehicles were starting to come into uh, existence. And so as we move forward in time, you know, I have here in my notes, uh, the, the game generally got popular in the late 19th century. And then by 1930 in the United States. So, again, this is only a period of you know half a century. There was over 1100 golf golf clubs around the country. So this would be, you know, country club type. Type situations. I'm not exactly sure what they used to look like back then, but 
generally there was a lot of people who were interested in the sport playing the sport. And while the game did evolve over the de- decades and years, it still generally had the same logistical issues that exist today, right? So to your point earlier, Hunter, about you being spry young men, you could sort of wander around you know, with your golf clubs. Uh, that that works a lot for for a lot of people. And even though you were on a smaller course, there were still a lot really large courses, and there were still people who didn't have that that sort of uh, uh, logistical needs, I guess to say. And therefore, people started thinking of, of solutions. How can you right. carry around this equipment, right? Because, again, not to assume people's knowledge, but golf has a lot of equipment. And, you know, there's yeah. another thing here, which is, I mean, if we look at golf, it's the associations are that it's a pretty high class sport. And I don't know if it necessarily started that way, but it mm-hmm. certainly developed that way oh, yeah. in the United States. And so, you know, people who are, have lots of privilege, don't want to carry their own stuff always either. So that's probably part of it as well. Oh boy, I'm happy you brought that up. Because <laughs> as I was doing my research for this episode, and I was sort of starting to try to get a, an answer of how the golf cart came to existence, I stumbled on a photograph that I thought was just so wild. And so it's it's on it's on Wikipedia. It's, I think it's just under the history of golf. Uh, it's where I found it. Photograph is of a man uh, he looks to be a wealthier gentleman from Florida who has a elephant, a young elephant, as his trained golf caddy. So he's carrying around really? all of his equipment. And it is, is it's one of those photos that you just like look at for a minute and you're like, no, that can't be. That's that's gotta be doctored in some way. But as far as I could tell, it, it's coming from some uh, actual repository of photographs from like the, the government. Like that's where they found it from. So it's public domain. As far as I could tell, it's legitimate. And so it's just wild to like start thinking as you're as you're talking about, you know, so the class of individuals who maybe gravitated to the sport and you know not wanting to carry their own stuff, you know, them, them having to think of solutions before this idea of the golf cart really came to be. And one of those solutions for at least one gentleman was a trained young elephant. Sounds like it could be a stunt, but I guess it's there. There's a picture of it, you know, sometimes. I have no idea. It's, yeah. But it's definitely a wild photo. Uh, the, the, I think the, if, even if it was a stunt, the fact that somebody even thought of it as a potential solution is pretty, pretty, pretty wild. So, so yeah, so, so the, there was a logistical problem that ultimately sort of kind of needed to be solved. You know, people didn't want to carry their equipment or people couldn't, you know, right. You know, asking somebody who maybe is uh, not as mobile to traverse around these big, big courses, maybe that's, that's an issue. And so that's when we start to see the idea of the actual golf cart come into existence. And so, again, I don't want to, you know, feed a fed horse here, but the, the history of the golf course is not as linear as we can hope as, as some of the other stuff that we sort of cover in this podcast so again i just want to make that qualification that we're going to try and do it justice but where things are actually happening and what, what what's sort of real or not may 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 actually be different from reality so the closest thing i could find to the original use of a golf cart was from 1932 by a pretty well-known golfer named jk watt Okay. So he was he was a wealthy wealthy individual and he really loved golf and at one point a person by the name of James Coggins wrote a biography about him it's called J.K. Wadley a tree from a tree god planted interesting uh, book name uh, I have not read the book in its entirety but I did find a few passages and uh, in that was uh, so according to this biography he at one point saw a three wheeled electric cart being used in Los Angeles California transport seniors to the grocery store. And that sort of sparked an idea in his head. So afterwards, he purchased a cart, a similar cart, I'm assuming, and found that it actually worked pretty well on the golf course. And so this was sort of the first reported use of the now popular golf cart. Something that's interesting about that is that we're, this episode's about getting back to that, basically. Getting back to taking the, the vehicle off the golf course and taking it to the store or something like that. So... Exactly. Interesting that that was the, the act, that was in that, fact the, the origin, and so it's kind of uh, 
back to the back to the future or back to the past or something like that. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, this I was actually able to track this all the way back to a popular mechanics magazine from May 1932 that doesn't call out JK Wadley by name, but there's just a small little passage and I'll sort of read it out here and says Golfer, that's the title, Golfer Follows Ball in Car Run by Electricity. And the passage is, following the ball in an electric auto, a California golfer, presumably this J.K. Wadley character, has covered more than 2,000 miles on the fairway. The player rides from stroke to stroke, unable to walk the full 18 holes. He had the car built for use on the links. And so there's a picture of this person uh, in this very rudimentary, sort of very small car. It definitely looks like it could be the origins of a golf cart. There's nothing more written on this, unfortunately. At that point, the magazine jumps to a whole nother topic. But this is sort of where we can really get the the first image, maybe potentially, of this person's golf cart. Golf cart. Very interesting. Um, but just moving on. So let's move beyond uh, uh, J.K. Wadley. So just sort of some of the early golf carts. So the golf carts that were actually used were were these smaller three wheeled electric caddies. And so there's an, again there's another uh, picture floating around from a company called the Cushman Company that really sort of paints these vehicles as something that I would resemble closer to maybe something you'd see being used in, in World War II, right? So it's like a, almost like so three wheel three wheeled vehicles. Half the front half is almost like a motorcycle with somebody like sitting there, and you, know, you have your little handlebars that turn left and right. And in the back would be some sort of storage. Maybe there's some seats back there and there's two wheels. And it kind of looks like, you know, at some point somebody sort of cut in half a motorcycle and welded it onto a cart. And that's sort of what was the original sort of three-wheeled golf cart. Very interesting, you know, where they might have started and sort of how they maybe evolved. Because quickly they evolved into the vehicles we know today, which are four-wheeled vehicles that have really just some sort of storage in the back for equipment. So that would be your, your golf clubs if, if you're playing golf and really two seats. Going, you know, even further ahead today, many of these golf carts are now uh, four seat vehicles, right? So, so the, the emphasis has shifted from, from really carrying just a couple people and equipment to maybe carrying more people. And that- so apparently. I read a little something that said by the 19, so you're talking about 1932, 1950s, golf carts have been pretty largely accepted by golfers. And so that's a pretty quick period of time, but that's also the post-war era Mm -hmm. where people, um, you know, there's a lot, there, there is an increase in affluence, not among everybody in the United States, but a lot of people. So there's probably an expansion of golf and you know, this this faith in technology and all this kind of stuff. So all of a sudden we enter into a period when golf carts are more socially acceptable among golfers. And then I found this, I don't know if you saw this in your research, but there's a company that you might not expect that was making golf carts in 1963, the Harley Davidson motor. Company. Oh yeah. Harley Davidson. Yeah. I, right? I, I did find that in my research. I couldn't find any, uh, any images of what they look like, but I, I was, saw a few images. Yeah. And so apparently, and they've made them for about 19 years. And some of this involves buying other companies and this kind of stuff. Um, but they started with a three wheel model, the kind that you're describing. And then in the 1970s developed a four wheel model. Um, and then some of them that I saw the images of were this sort of pumpkin orange that I associate with the logo <laughs> of Harley Davidson as well. And then apparently in 1969, for a short period of time, for a number of years, Harley Davidson made an electric golf cart as well. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's so they were, track, most of them right? were gas yeah. powered, but there was yeah. an electric one as well. Um, that kind so, of track just what we know yeah. of the evolution of the golf carts. I right. know, there, I, and even to this day, I know there are some gas powered ones. I think the majority of them are electric these days because the intent is that gas is loud and that's just not something that really associates with the golf course very well in my right. my research. I've also seen, and I don't know if you saw this, that there is a, n- a number of golf carts that are constructed this way. Oh, there's also conversion kits so that you can put solar panels on the roof of the car. I did. And there are these yeah. solar panel golf carts, which is, I think, a pretty interesting idea. Apparently increases the driving distance on one single charge. And, um, 
Apparently, the Detroit Zoo uses some of them to get around the zoo as well. So these solar-powered golf carts. So we're starting to get into uses beyond the yeah. golf course. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about sort of some of the uses and some of this stuff, like like solar-powered golf carts and sort of where where those are mostly in use and why that actually makes a lot mm-hmm. of sort of sense. So start getting more to the geography of of it as we as we head on to our episode. Um, but I think just before we head to our first ad break, I, I sort of wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, we talked a little about the history. You know, as we're talking about golf carts as a as a method of transportation, this isn't really history, but it's just sort of talking about sort of how it's the idea is starting to bubble up in recent history. And so going back uh, just a few years ago, I believe it's from 2015, there was a Harvard Business Review, a, a, a study that came out of uh, that uh, magazine or, or organization that really look at really whether Tesla, the electric vehicle maker that we know today, was mm. a disruptive innovator for the automobile industry. This isn't an episode about Tesla, but that's just where this article stems from. And just to, before we even get to that study, just to talk about what, what it means to be a disruptive innovator, you know, as, in terms of business, I sort of found this definition. So it's, it's a theory that's used to describe when an industry is really turned upside down by a newcomer, and the tr- traditional industry either has to react, compete, or face existential disaster. And so a good example that they, they use, or maybe it's from another uh, article that, that used it, was Airbnb's impact on the hotel industry. All right, so Airbnb sort of popped up, and all of a sudden, the hotel, which wasn't you know accustomed to having to compete basically with people's individual homes, now had to. So there's three sort of qualifiers here. It's, you know, one does the product target overserved customers by offering lower performance at a lower price point or create a new market? Two, does it create quote unquote asymptomatic motivation, meaning that when the disruptor is motivated to enter higher performance segments over time, do existing players, are they, are they motivated to buy it? Right. So Airbnb and hotel industry again, right. As they move into places that look more like hotels, you know, our hotels trying to fight it or what's happening there. And then three, can it improve performance fast enough to keep pace with customers' expectations while retaining its low-cost structure? So getting that out of the way, let's move back to the Harvard Harvard Business uh, Study on Tesla. And so as they were talking a lot about Tesla and electric cars in general, they found that really Tesla and, and electric vehicles that maybe at one point were potentially thought of as being a potential disruptor really didn't really meet any of those markers. In fact, I think even though Tesla has grown quite a bit today, again, this is all future episode, really what they've become is more of a, just another sort of vehicle type within the traditional segment of the automobile industry. But what they ended on, which I thought was really interesting, was this idea that the actual disruptor to personal transportation, automotive transportation is the neighborhood electric vehicle is what they call it. Or could be, right? Could like be. Like looking ahead. Yeah, looking ahead. It could yeah. be. It's a, it's a potential. That's what they saw as a as the disruptor that, that could actually shake things up in the industry. And so that was the neighborhood electric vehicles, what they call it. But really, that that is the golf cart. Uh, and the idea here is that a lot of these trips that are made today, going to the grocery store, you know, all these different things, you know, if we look to a statistic by the U.S. Department of Energy, over half of all trips in the U.S. that were taken by personal vehicle were less than three miles. A lot of these trips could, in fact, be served by a golf cart, which is cheaper, it's new, uh, and it meets a lot of these metrics for actually, you know, meeting people's needs that they that they would otherwise just use their personal vehicle vehicle for. And so, Maybe just to end this the segment on, I have this quote here from Alyssa Walker at Curbed, which is a, another sort of urban-centric website. And this quote is, uh, those golf carts, in fact, make a lot of urban transportation planners salivate. By some estimates, one-third of all trips in the villages, which is a city we're going to talk about here in a little bit, are taken by them. They run on electricity or on a little bit of non-ethanol gasoline. They are lightweight and barely pollute. They are not supposed to go faster than 20 miles per hour, and they don't kill many people in the way, or as many people in the way that cars do. Although it does happen, so there are some crash statistics where people have. Been. And we can talk about yeah. the safety we, aspect. We can talk about the safety aspect yeah. as well. But that, that's sort of where where all this is going to towards is you know 
so many trips today that are really being driven around on these much larger vehicles. And, you know, maybe we'll talk a little bit about sort of the size of vehicles today compared to how they were, you know, 20 years ago. They really have gotten really massive. And so what does it mean when, you know, maybe just a souped up golf cart could, you know, meet all those needs? And I think that's really fun to fun idea to think about. And so we're going to have some fun with that, you know, sort of after our, our first ad break here, unless there's anything else we need to cover, Hunter. No, I think uh, this rounds out the section pretty nicely. All right. Well, let's get to some ads and then we're going to, well, we're, we're going to start some, we're going to start talking about where maybe some of these things are legally allowed and not legally allowed. Here we go. We are back uh, talking a little bit more about the golf carts and sort of maybe actually starting to hit on some of the geography of it a little bit. But first, let's talk about the street legality of these things. Hunter? Well, I, as you're going to discuss, I think in a moment, it, 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 Matt, it changes from place to place and states get yeah. to make policies on that. But there's a list of things. There's a list of uh, aspects that can make a golf cart street legal. And of course, as we talked about, not appropriate for highways, but for smaller streets. Mm-hmm. Um, and particularly when we're trying to keep speeds down a little bit, this might help with that. So these are the things that would make a golf cart street legal brake lights, headlights, Makes sense. rear and side reflectors, uh, turn signals, exterior mirrors, seat belts. And when we talk about safety, we'll talk about that's, that becomes very important. Mm-hmm. Uh, a windshield because maybe not all golf carts are golf carts are designed that way. So, uh, and a horn. Um, the max speed is 20 to 25 miles per hour. And I guess the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration created a category called the low speed vehicle in 1997, which this sort of corresponds to. Um, and in fact, the state of Florida makes a distinction between golf carts and LSVs. So, and I think the speed might have something to do with that. So, as you're about to talk about, you know, where, what state you're in, if you're in the United States, has a lot to do with how legal it is for you to drive one of these around outside of a golf course. Right. And so we're, we're going to cover some, some U.S. states. Obviously, around the world, these things are actually in use in various capacities. And we're not going to be able to cover every single country. Obviously, we're based here in the United States. But, you know, obviously, if you're interested in sort of maybe where your where golf carts are located in your country, you know, I'm sure there, there could be an interesting sort of qualification if it's allowed or not allowed. But let's get into some legal requirements. And so I think the, the most important aspect that I could find is um, there are really only one, two, three, four, five, six states that are, they just flat out aren't allowed on public public roads. And that would be the states of uh, Delaware, Maryland, Missouri, Rhode Island, New York, which we'll get to in a minute. And then one I found particularly interesting, which was the state of Hawaii. And the reason why if you're, if you're not at all familiar with Hawaii, the reason why I find it so interesting, Hunter, is because I think in my head, it almost makes a lot of sense for a smaller island sort of state or community to be able to lean on these smaller vehicles more so than these bigger, more expensive vehicles. To me, it just seems almost a little backwards. Um, I wasn't able to dig into Hawaii too much. Uh, about the, the reasons why, but it just, it's never been something that's been allowed. And so we'll get to another state in which it's sort of flipped. And so maybe they just haven't had their moment yet. Yeah. I think that there, there are much smaller Island places throughout the world mm-hmm. where, uh, you know, internal combustion engine type vehicles or, or cars are, are not permitted. And then golf carts figure pretty prominently in some of them, but Hawaii is big enough where it doesn't really fall into that particular category. Yeah, exactly. And we're not going to talk about, so there's, there's one example, it's a uh, Catalina Island in California. It's off the coast of uh, LA area. They, that Island actually does use golf carts pretty predominantly. We're not going to talk too much about that community when we get to that sec- section, but that is a good example of, of a very small Island where these, these vehicles make a lot of sense, you know, they don't actually have to go that far to, you know, get around the island, for example. Catalina is a little big. I don't think a, a golf cart could circumnavigate it without running out of juice, but generally it is smaller than the state of Hawaii or like the island of Oahu or something like that. Yeah, you have apparently there are many islands uh, that are part of Belize where this <clears> is used. Uh, Hamilton Island in Queensland, Australia. So I'm, I'm sure we could find examples in different places. But there's a particular scale which it seems to work at the best. Yeah. And then there's so there's one state 
that n- New York, that it's an actual crime to ride these on public roads rather than just a traffic violation. So in Delaware, Hawaii, Maryland, Missouri, and Rhode Island, if you're caught riding on one of these, uh, and we'll talk about Arizona in a minute, these would just be a ticket, right? It's just like if you were, you know, speeding or you ran a light or something that's, you know, there is a legal definition between a, a violation and an actual crime, right? So New York ultimately decided to outlaw them. So it was a crime to ride them. This would actually track pretty well with some of their other laws around alternative mobility. Uh, if people, again, this isn't about, this, this episode is not about electric bikes, but if you are familiar with that sort of uh, effort, you'll know that New York had a long and tumultuous sort of pass with legalizing the use of electric vehicles, largely that focused around sort of a lot of their immigrant communities and sort of what that meant to them. So this kind of tracks, right? New York, despite being a very, well, at least having a really very urban city that you know, should have a wealth of different options and historically has in the subway and all these other sort of public transit options, very hostile towards the golf cart as a method of transportation, which I thought w- was pretty interesting. Uh, moving ahead, so we'll just talk about a few states that sort of, you know, their requirements. So there's California. So in California, golf carts must weigh less than 1,300 pounds. So if you remember back to what, what qualified as a golf cart, I said it was about 500 to 1,100 pounds. They can get heavier. California has limited them to 1,300 pounds. And they can't carry more than two people, one of which is the driver. So that's an interesting distinction because, again, as we talk about transportation or golf carts as a method of transportation, we start wanting to talk a little bit more about these bigger golf carts that actually seat more people rather than equipment. So California has sort of disallowed that from the beginning. Uh, And California also, as you pointed out earlier, Hunter, requires a safety glazed windshield uh, and fenders. Uh, I actually don't know if you mentioned fenders, but the windshield Mm -hmm. is important, which again, a lot of golf carts, just as they're used to to get around the golf course, don't actually always have that windshield in place. Uh, In Florida, you can drive a cart on public roads with a speed limit under 25 miles per hour if you are at least 14 years old and traveling at least 20 miles per hour. So it's kind of an interesting aspect. You need to be going a certain speed as well. Uh, You must have a driver's license to drive over 20 miles per hour. So if you're less than 14, or if you're 14 years old and you don't have a driver's license and you want to drive them on a public road, you need to be able to go over 20 miles per hour. You need to have that uh, special license. And the cart will have to be DMV registered and insured. So again, this is sort of crossover from the automobile industry for what the requirements are. Uh, as we, as more and people, more and more people use this as a vehicle choice, there, of course, um, are other stipulations that are required around insurance. And so that becomes uh, one of the big sticking points, uh, with, with adopting this as a form of transportation, because there's not a lot of widely insured golf cart drivers. And that's something that might need to change if this were to become more of a standard form of transportation, uh, to get from, you know, place to place outside of a golf course. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little about the safety of, of these things. But yeah, to your point, golf carts, you know, there there are golf cart crashes. You know, there are people who get injured in golf cart crashes. And therefore, when you don't have the same sort of insurance system that, that cars do, you don't really have that safety net. And sort of what does that mean? So Florida is actually sort of getting out ahead of this a little bit. Um, they, Florida also had one other sort of stipulation, which I thought was really interesting. And that they only allow golf cart usage, again, this is only on public roads, between sunrise and sunset. Mm-hmm. So these are not these are not vehicles for nighttime is basically what they're saying. Uh, in Texas, you can operate a golf cart only on local roads where allowed by individual county or local governments. So this they've sort of separated it from the, uh, the state and sort of said cities and counties get to manage their roads and sort of what, what they're going to allow or disallow which is an interesting sort of method of, uh, of regulation. And then you have Arizona. And so Arizona is kind of an interesting issue or an interesting state in this regard, because while we tend to think of it as being a pretty hospitable place for golf carts, um, obviously it has a large snowbird population. So that, that has brought with it a large golf uh, contingency, right? There's a lot of golf courses in Phoenix and Tucson. And as such, there's a lot of, people who are uh, mostly older people who like to drive golf carts around. And so uh, back in 2014, the 
golf carts were not legally allowed to drive on roadways. And so what ended up happening was there was a some tickets being written to these, these people. And all of a sudden, uh, in a town called Sun City, they really pulled together a sort of movement to basically get state legislator and then the governor to sign off on a law that would then allow golf carts to be on public roads so long as they stuck to the shoulder or if it was available the bike lane. And so this, again, this is an interesting situation just because one, golf carts aren't allowed on the main road, right? They wouldn't be allowed to be inside the, the center lane. And they would, however, be allowed to operate in the bike lane. And so this gets into a, a question of the infrastructure that's being provided by cities and sort of what is it for and sort of maybe what are the cross benefits of providing that additional infrastructure, right? Um, ultimately, uh, the there are more than 38,000 golf carts now registered in Arizona, as you know, this a few years ago, with more than 30,000 of those being in Maricopa County. And so that's that the county that Phoenix, as well as its suburbs, sort of exist in. Woo! All right, let's move on. So that's, that's broadly where where carts are are allowed today. Uh, they're they're generally allowed in other other states. Those are sort of the three big ones, or sorry, I should say four big ones that sort of have their own regulations that generally where we see them the most. We're going to get into some examples more specific of places that use it more heavily. But I think generally, as we're talking about golf carts as a method of transportation, you know, we had that quote earlier from Alyssa Walker, sort of, you know, making urban transportation planners salivate. And the, I just kind of wanted to run through some reasons why. Right. So as we, as we think about sort of people, why would people want to use a golf cart rather than a car? Um, and I think some solutions that planners see, and you know, I'm a, I'm a recovering city planner myself, city transportation planner, is, you know, one, they, they do they do take that mantle of being able to solve the short trip issue. Right. So being able to get people, you know, a couple miles by a golf cart is, you know, far more efficient, a little bit more. Uh, safe, I would argue, uh, and really meet some of the same needs that we now see popping up with the rise of micro micro mobility solutions. Which would be, you know, if you live in a city and you see a bunch of scooters sort of hanging around, you know, your your sidewalks, that would be a micro mobility solution. And then this also lends itself to maybe some potential first and last mile solutions. And what that means is, you know, if you, for example, you take a, a bus to from one side of the city to the next next side of the city, you know, how are people getting to and from the bus stops, right? That would be your first and your last mile. Obviously, somebody wouldn't pull out a golf cart from their pocket and throw it on the, the ground and run off on it. But really thinking about what are the solutions that maybe that a network of golf carts could then connect people to additional services that wouldn't be efficiently served by a large public bus, right? Um, thinking about in terms of traffic, uh, congestion, traffic solutions, obviously, as more and more people move into cities and as the population grows at large, our cars have gotten bigger and larger. And so that has had a compounding effect of increasing traffic, increasing pollution, when really a, something, you know, maybe a half of our population was served by golf carts. Would that be a potential solution in easing of traffic? And a good example of maybe this being used in another part of the world, not with golf carts, but um, is Amsterdam and, and the Netherlands at large. And so if you're not familiar with that country, they use bicycles as a large part of the transportation. I, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but I want to say about one third of all trips in Amsterdam were by bike. And they also have an extensive transit network and you know, there are also cars there. But what it's done is they've allowed for a lot more different kinds of transportation. And this isn't to say that they don't have traffic issues or pollution issues, but it could probably be a, be a lot worse if it was, say, a system that was similar to the average American city, which is very heavily car dependent. And then finally, our safety, which I know, Hunter, you have some stats on. But generally, I think the point I want to make is that as cars, again, regular personal automobiles have gotten bigger and larger, we have seen a increase, pretty dramatic increase in the rate of pedestrian and cyclist injuries and deaths. And we are just now, to this day, getting to some studies that are actually starting to figure out some answers to this. And one of those answers, and you know, there's never a single answer, right? I mean, the world is more complicated than that. But one of those answers 
that they're finding is that the actual size of vehicles is having a pretty pretty uh, impactful effect on whether somebody survives or not when they get hit by a car. And so, yeah. yeah. Another, right. I mean, another thing that, that is a big determinant on whether somebody's going to get injured or killed by a collision with the vehicle is, is vehicle speed. And so if the car is going at 20 miles per hour and you're hit, nobody wants to get hit by a car going any, um, any speed, but if you get hit by a car, the average, you know, on average, that's going 20 miles per hour, you have a really good chance of surviving it like 90% or something like that. However, if that same vehicle, if that same vehicle is going 40 miles per hour, then you have a 90% chance of not surviving. it. And so, you know, one of the things that a movement towards more lighter, smaller vehicles that don't go as fast is, is that there, you know, there might still be collisions, but there wouldn't be uh, quite as many fatalities associated with it. Um, of course, this is part of a whole bigger conversation about car culture, but, you know, I mean, that's one of the things we could weave into that and that, you know, having more and more of a movement towards adopting something like this might sort of change the way that people think about transportation and what is a, you know, a good form of transportation. And so that, that's something that could work towards safety as well. Now, having said that, according to one source, every year there are 13,000 golf cart related accidents. Now that doesn't compare to the number of accidents involving vehicles. And I don't have those statistics, but um, that would be something else. So uh, 13,000 that require a trip to the emergency room, which means of course, there's many more. About half of those accidents involve younger children under the age of 16. And half of those accidents involve children falling or being thrown from a moving cart. So that's why the use of seatbelts, which is you know, now mandatory in cars, um, you know, any kind of policies relating to golf carts, you know, would help keep people safe if that were the case. Um, and apparently any cart that can reach 20 to 25 miles per hour are already required to have seat belts, whether they're used or not is something else. But even at, you know, going as slow as 11 miles per hour, it's easy for adults or children to be thrown from a golf cart. Most standard golf carts only have brakes on rear wheels, which, um, you know, mitigate your ability to to control a vehicle and, and, and when you're stopping suddenly. And so certainly there's some benefits from safety that could be associated with golf carts, but you know, we want to think about both sides of the, the situation as well. Right. No, I think to your point, the one, yeah, there's there's obviously gonna be less golf cart crashes than car crashes. I mean, for one, there's just a, a lot more vehicles out there. Um but I think you know, going back to the point of like, well, these are you know slower, um, right? So they're they're maximum. They're probably going twenty five miles per hour. And as as you pointed out, the difference between twenty and forty miles per hour is honestly, it's probably the difference between life and death for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody wants to get hit by anything, but you know, if if it were to happen, you would want something that's going moving slower. They also just have less mass behind them, right? So you know, right. if you get hit by a, a twenty miles per hour by a Ford F whatever big old truck that will hit you with more force because there's just a lot more weight behind it. And not only that, but those trucks are sitting, you know, these days pretty high. So if you, if you stand in front of one of those trucks today, again, you know, as we talk about cars getting bigger and bigger, trucks have also gotten bigger and larger. You know, I'm, I'm not a, a short person. I'm, I'm about 5'11 myself. And sometimes I will walk in front of one of these trucks and I'm just barely at the hood of it. And so you have to think about, you know, when one of those things, does hit a person, unfortunately, where is it hitting versus a smaller vehicle or even a, a smaller car? You know, where is it hitting them, right? Is it hitting them in their legs or is it hitting them in their vital organs? And I think that's a big uh, uh, issue around the safety uh, issue here versus golf carts is that these bigger trucks, especially in SUVs and what have you, are hitting people faster speeds with more mass in a place that ultimately causes a lot more damage to them. Well, what, you know, if we start mixing golf carts with larger vehicles on even city roads where you can go 20, 25 miles per hour, we're going to see collisions between golf carts and other vehicles. And yeah, uh, that, you know, that is not favorable for whoever happens to be in the golf cart. In that no. Area. And I think this gets to ultimately, you know, maybe uh, one of our, my, my big points with this episode is you sort of, sort of hinted at this earlier, but, you know, as we start talking about the broader issue of car culture and sort of how we've allocated our space within our cities and 
really angled and really frightened. Mm-hmm. To this day, you know, I would argue across the entire country of the U.S., but probably a lot of different countries as well, 99.9% of all space that's being used for travel is really been dedicated towards the vehicle, the personal vehicle. Uh, a huge amount. Certainly only, in the United States. Certainly in the United States. Only recently have we started seeing things such as bike lanes pop up and now protected bike lanes, even but those are still a very small amount. And so I think, you know, as we start start talking about golf carts as transportation, obviously I think there there becomes this need for how are we allocating our space and what is that space dedicated for? Because I think you're right. If, if golf carts are running down the middle of, you know, Broadway and whatever, you know, major city in America, you know, it's inevitable that somebody goes through a red light or, or turns without noticing, especially because, you know, some of these cars have a height differential as well, right? You know, if you're sitting in one of those really tall trucks and somebody's cruising, you know, next to you in a small golf cart, can that person actually see you? Will they take the time to actually see you? You know, these are all questions to, to ask and, you know, at some point, probably no, in which case there's a collision. So a lot of this gets into the argument of, you know, as we start rethinking sort of how our public space is used, what is dedicated for what? And so I think this is to, um, what let's say, was it uh, the Florida, I think? There was one state that allowed, uh, that, that sort of required cars, uh, golf carts to, oh, maybe it was Arizona, to be in the, either on the shoulder or in a bike lane. Where one was one was necessary, probably to prevent issues such as this. Mm. So, anyways, um, but yeah. So that, that that's just sort of a, a sort of bigger picture look at sort of maybe some of the safety issues and sort of maybe the space allocation issues. Uh, but generally, I think you know golf carts you know, can be used in different settings. In fact, I have a really fun uh, funny example here, and maybe this is where we'll you know leave before we uh, we'll do this and then we'll do another ad break. But so back in. Where's my article here? Um, here it is. Back in 2022, this was April 1st, 2022. And if you're from the United States, you might recognize April 1st as being a sort of quirky holiday that we call April Fool's Day. And during this day, the Eric Botcher, who is a uh, uh, council member of New York City, issued a for immediate release uh, plan on Twitter that basically stated golf carts will be the only permitted type of motor vehicle allowed in Manhattan. A major step towards making New York City the first golf carts only municipality in the United States. And what was, what was funny about this, and he has like a funny little picture of some photoshopped golf carts you know, going down Times Square inside of the image. But what was actually really funny about, funny about this was that, you know, people who were looking at this, New Yorkers presumably who would follow, you know, the council member, Actually, kind of really loved this idea. Um, you know, there were some some quotes here. Uh, you know, this you know basically say you know when you when you think when you think you're making an April Fool's joke, but realize most of your constituents actually prefer this model of transportation. Uh, another person said, "quote I know this is a joke, but it's hard to overstate how much this would actually improve New York safety, noise, air quality, city aesthetics, usable land, and probably traffic too." And then a third one said, just very simply. Please actually do this. So <laughs> I think it's just a really funny story that sort of talking about the sort of urban uh, angle of this that, you know, maybe as, you know, for some of these bigger cities that are inundated by larger cars and they see physically, right, very physical, they can see their space shrinking due to the overwhelming mass of these big, big bigger vehicles that they see the, as this idea of golf carts as transportation as actually being kind of a nice one. <laughs> Uh, and so with that, we will head to our third and final uh, ad break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about sort of some of these places that are maybe a little bit unique in that they actually do use golf carts as transportation uh, pretty regularly. So here we go. And we are back. So we're going to close out of our golf carts as transportation episode, a huge nerdy topic of mine that I have wanted to do for a little while now. And we're going to close it out by just maybe talking about some places in the United States that seem to have a, a bit of a golf cart community attached to them. And the first one I want to talk about is a place called Peachtree, Georgia. And Peachtree, Georgia was the subject of an article that was written by David Zipper in August 15th of 2022. And the, the article is called Why Golf Carts, 
Yes, golf carts are a transportation mode of the future. And in it, he talks a lot about the city and how it's sort of evolved into becoming a, well, really a golf cart city, almost kind of by accident. So if you're not familiar with Peachtree, uh, Peachtree City, it's a uh, suburb of Atlanta. So it's not quite within sort of, you know, the really urban environment of a major city, but it's also not entirely departed either. Um, there's about 38,000 people who live in the city. And it was chartered in 1959 as a series of subdivisions. And this is the most important part, linked by footpaths as well as traditional streets. And so if you're thinking about, you know, how a city is traditionally laid out, you know, if you're living in a city right now, you might you know, recognize that, you know, you have a grid or what have you that sort of you know, connects everything together by just normal streets. There are some cities that have thought a little bit more into more more involved in how people might be getting around or what might be enjoyable to get around. And one of those ways is this, you know, what they're calling a footpath, but, you know, maybe largely would be considered a trail. And these would be sort of more winding. They might go through more nature and they sort of like connect around to wherever. Here in Portland, we have a pretty extensive trail system, uh, although I would say it's probably as connected as the one in Peachtree, but, you know, you can get you know, to quite a few far-flung places in Portland just by riding this totally independent, separated trail system, which is kind of neat. And so the city was sort of built around this trail system. And in fact, if you actually go to Google Maps and you type in peach tree and you go there and you sort of look at it, you can start seeing all the little dashed green lines that would indicate it's a path of some sort rather than a normal street. And you can kind of see that they are everywhere. And in fact, I would actually, this was, this was really fun for me. I kind of did this for 15 or 20 minutes the other day as I would, um, use Google Street View and go to like a street, uh, view, um, level for wherever there was a intersecting trailhead. I would sort of plot my little guy down and I would sort of look around. And sure, sure enough, every time I did that, I would see a little golf cart on the trail. Right. <laughs> yeah. Making its way through the city. Well, there was a built in infrastructure, right? I mean, that's, there, that's explaining why this is viable because the city decides to sort of embrace this, right? And so exactly. They start to develop these paths so they'd be even more conducive to golf carts being able to navigate them. Exactly. So I, I guess, you know, a, a number of years ago, a few residents began to use uh, uh, golf carts on the footpaths to hop between neighborhoods. Or maybe to commercial commercial centers, and I think it was just one of those things that as people saw what maybe these footpaths could be used for, that it became sort of an idea and inspiration. They they sort of wanted to join in too as sort of maybe a way to get around not having to use their personal car. And so many more joined in, uh, especially after the city uh, paved the pathways to be ten feet across. And so as I was sort of poking around, I actually did find a few Google Street View video, uh, images where you could drop right in on the trail. So there was somebody with like a golf cart and they were riding in a golf cart and they had like one of those little spinny cameras and you could sort of zoom around. Um, and they are pretty narrow, the, the, these paths. And so at one point they, they passed somebody and both carts sort of had to be off on the, the side of the road in order to pass each other. But that said, it was still very viable and very usable, clearly. So. Um, cars are, of course, banned from these multi-use paths, these trails. Uh, so using a golf cart, uh, or, or sorry, sorry, those using a golf cart are welcome as long with people who are on foot or riding a bike or, you know, any sort of other mobility device you might have. So they are sort of a mixing zone for a lot of different types of transportation. But going back to what we were saying about safety and sort of the relative safety of, of golf carts versus, you know, maybe vehicles, having golf carts and bicycles and even people on a, shared path may be less problematic than having golf carts on the road. And so well, something something yeah. distinctive about the Peachtree situation is that one of the things that we've talked about already is that you know, golf carts are and, and we'll talk about it with some of these other examples are very popular with um the retirement people of retirement. Mm-hmm. Age, right? But in Peachtree, it's very popular with high school students as well. And two of the high schools have dedicated parking lots for golf carts. And so it's interesting that um, here's an example of younger people also embracing this same technology. Uh, And then the logo for the town, of Peachtree, is a golf cart. And apparently it used to have the silhouette of golf clubs in the back. And they took that out. And so 
the logo now has fully embraced the idea that the city identifies with golf carts that aren't being used to to bring golf cart to, to, on the golf course to bring you know bring clubs around, but to for other purposes. Yeah, it's 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 a mo- it's a method of transportation that that is now iconic to their to their city, right? It's you know at that, at a certain point, it's no longer about the golf; it's now about getting people people around. And that could that like to your point, I think it's to everybody, you know, not just people that we might rightly or wrongly associate the golf cart with, which would be you know people who are older and maybe wealthier. But now, you know, maybe it's, you know, high school kids who use it as a viable option to get to school and, you know, their high school now has parking for it. And so instead of kids learning how to drive cars, maybe they're learning how to drive golf carts in Peachtree. Uh, so today, Peachtree City has about 100 miles of paths, uh, which form a comprehensive network. So linking neighborhoods and their destinations. This would be complete with tunnels that dip under uh, streets and roads, as well as I've seen a few uh, dedicated bridges that go over. So they really have done a pretty remarkable job of making sure everything's connected and as well as separated. So again, not to go back to our safety, but I think they really were thinking ahead of how do we ensure that the mixing environment for these vehicles is not with the uh, kind of vehicle that really can cause the most amount of damage, which is you know your big trucks and your cars and what have you. Very fascinating issue. Um, I would love to visit Peachtree if I ever get to Atlanta. I might have to make a trip down there just to see this in action. The next place I kind of want to talk about is the, the Coachella Valley. And if you're not familiar with Coachella Valley, it's in the sort of high desert area of California. It really, it's, it links to the, I, w- I would say, probably fairly popular uh, um, city of Palm Springs with other sort of cities around uh, uh, in Indio, Palm Desert, these kinds of places. And so... Back in 2012, I believe this the Coachella Valley started uh, a trend or a, a concept called the Coachella Valley Link, which was a proposed to be a network of bicycle paths connecting the various disparate desert cities together. So going through all of these uh, wonderful desert landscapes, and they have some very very beautiful um, paths they created. And while this originally started out as a plan for pedestrians and bicyclists, the only way that they were actually able to get this funded and approved by their populace was that they allowed for the, um, what was called low speed electric vehicles, which would include golf carts to actually to also use the path as well. And so today, while it's not complete yet, it's still under construction in various parts, but they have completed large segments of it within sort of the city of Palm Springs, which has a lot of golf courses and a lot of people who, uh, you know, use golf carts as transportation, including a sizable elderly population that uses them. You can get to quite a few places just using this, uh, it's called CD Link, Coachella Valley Link, to, you know, bop around town. In fact, um, as I'm looking at the map now, and if you go to CoachellaValleyLink.com, you can sort of see some of the, the images here. Uh, but just as I'm looking at one, I can see that the city of Palm Springs has a pretty uh, uh, sizable loop that's been completed so that people can really sort of go in a lot of different places within the city. So it's really kind of cool to be able to see a city that, again, the intent was to maybe at one point to have this be enabling for cyclists and uh, pedestrians, but now also thinking about this sort of third mode of alternative transportation, which is the golf cart. And actually, you know, as I, as I think about a place such as Palm Springs, and if you're, you're not familiar with it, it's a very hot, very warm, dry environment. I can actually see the appeal of wanting something that you know, maybe for necessity, you actually can't walk or bike because it'd be too draining within the heat. So very interesting uh, location. But there's one other location that we're going to talk about today, which is also very interesting. And that is the Villages, Florida. We talked about this already very briefly. Hunter, tell us a little bit about the Villages. So the Villages is the largest retirement community in the United States, which... Uh, has over, there's a lot that can be said about this community. In fact, there's some articles about it, newspaper articles. There's a uh, documentary made about it that is called Some Kind of Heaven, and it chronicles what happens when you get the largest uh, retirement community together and the kinds of things that happen there. But the, you know, for our purposes, the reason we're talking about it is because this also this area also has over 90 miles of cart paths 
and golf carts have been highly embraced as a form of transportation to get around. And if you read about what goes on there, you'll also, this is where you start to read about some of the the uh, golf carts that have been customized to look mm-hmm. like old cars from the 1950s and all this kind of stuff. And so, you know, if you have disposable income and this is important to you, this is something that one can spend money on. But again, we're talking about it because it, it's a place where the use of golf carts is extremely widespread and it's used for uh, by a large percentage of the, it seems to be used by a lot of people there. Yeah, I just have here in my my notes here that by some estimates, one third of all trips in the villages are taken by golf cart. So that's a lot, right? Uh, you, if you talk about like in any any individual city, you know, we're going to use Portland as an example here. You know, at its height, you know, Portland probably fairly well known as a bicycle city, but at its height, it was only about seven percent of the population used it uh, uh, for, for, for their various trips yep. for commuting. Uh, so that and that was considered a lot. So to have Fully, you know, potentially 33% is pretty momentous for anything. Uh, there's not a lot of places aside from maybe uh, New York City in terms of, you know, the subway that would have that, that amount of mode shift away from personal automobiles to something else. But I think to your point, you know, this is a, this is a retirement community. So it means, you know, you need to be a certain age to be able to uh, live there and, and sort of exist there. I think it's shockingly low. And by oh, shockingly low, I mean 55, which 55. I don't really consider to be retirement. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyways, yeah. But I think, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm thinking about alternative modes of transportation, I think broadly when a lot of people are thinking about alternative modes of transportation, transportation, they're thinking about people who ride bikes. They're thinking about people who ride a scooter. They're thinking about some of those other sort of electric mobility options you might see of generally young people Writing these things around, right? Um, and that's because, you know, generally when we think of younger people, we're generally thinking of people who are more amenable to certain sort of doing things a little bit differently, you know, using a little bit more effort to, you know, what have you. And I think the villages actually provide a really good model for engaging a community that maybe most of the rest of the country, I would argue, uh, is pretty, you know, dependent on their vehicles, but maybe they would actually be more amenable towards a, an alternative, quote unquote, mode of transportation. And I think that's really interesting to think about as, you know, as again, a recovering city transportation planner, you know, we're constantly trying to think of how can we get people to use their cars less and use something else more. The um, villages, it has to be said, has a lot of things going for it that lends itself to this kind of dynamic, to this kind of transportation. So uh, it's, a, it's a suburban type development true. that has places that you can visit close by to where people live. Right. And so it's not like people have to get in a car and drive 10 or 15 miles to get someplace. They can within a few miles, get to restaurants or community centers or place where they're going to see music or whatever it is. So things are kind of the infrastructure lends itself to that. The other thing is that it's in Florida, which has really mild winters compared to say Minnesota or you know, many places in the northern part of the country, which, you know, would make it much more difficult to use these vehicles, which you know are, don't have heat because they're open to the environment uh, throughout lots. So it's got that going for it. It's got, it's built around neighborhood scale. People are taking mostly short trips. They're retired. So people aren't, nest, most people aren't going to work. Um, you know, some of the, I mean, which probably lean into some of the challenges to to this technology or to this thing as well. And um, some of the disadvantages are that although cheaper than cars, they're still not cheap. And you know, yeah. people who are retired to have a pretty good grasp on at least what their disposable income is. Um, whereas for people who are younger, it's kind of up in the air. They don't know where things are going to go necessarily. Um, a lot of these people aren't in, in the villages, aren't char- aren't traveling longer distances. You can't really lock stuff up or much up in a golf cart. So that might be... Uh, stumbling point for some people. Um, and because it's been so widely adopted, it's safer because people are expecting to see them. And if you start mm-hmm. using golf carts in a community that hasn't adopted it much, then there's going to be more confrontation between cars and maybe other forms of transportation in there. So again, these are not to be negative, but want to be kind of realistic about the oh. kinds of places where this can work and places that will have additional challenges to adopting this as a mode of tra- widespread wide, uh, mode of transportation. 
Totally. And I, to your point, you know, the villages, I was reading this curved article, which goes into the villages and sort of the golf cart sort of craze that's going on there a little bit more in depth. And one of the things that they pointed out was that, okay, yes, you know, by some estimates, you know, one third of all trips in the villages are taken by golf carts, which is a momentous amount. But that doesn't mean people have eschewed their personal vehicles either. That's right. So, you know, this, this, you know, I don't know the the demographics of the villages. Um, Specifically, I would hazard a guess and say that's probably on the wealthier side of, of things. And so what, you know, the article sort of pointed out was that most houses that are built there now still come with a single car garage as well as a little mini garage for people's golf carts. So there's still that sort of, well, one, there's still the wealth to be able to enable these kinds of things that doesn't exist everywhere, right? Right, like not everybody can afford a vehicle, much less two vehicles. Exactly, right? Because a lot of used cars are cheaper than a new golf cart, right? Totally, yeah. And and again, you know, if you're if you're thinking about it, you know, you're, you're somebody who can only afford, you know, one 10,000 piece of equipment, $10,000 piece of equipment, you know, what are you going to, to opt for? Would it be a golf cart or would it be a... Uh, a personal vehicle that can get you farther into more places. And I think that's a, that's a really good argument to, to have. And I would argue that most people would probably choose the vehicle as I think probably illustrated by our current, you know, setup within our environment. But, you know, maybe in some places, you know, such as Peachtree and in the villages, it does offer, you know, at least maybe more of that choice where somebody can only afford one. Maybe it does make more sense and they know that they don't need to go, you know, from Florida or sort of from the villages in Florida to, Orlando or, you know, another major city, you know, across the state that they can just use this as an opportunity. So that, that's sort of where a lot of this sort of like, you know, it's an alternative mode of transportation, but it's probably not going to be the primary mode of transportation around the country. Um, and the villages, you know, we've sort of touched on this a little bit, but the villages at large is a very interesting place. Uh, I would encourage anybody to just go read up on it because it's, uh, in my reading, you know, they even had sort of Disney Imagineers help them design the city in a lot of ways. So it's just an interesting, fascinating location that has, you know, made some headlines in the past for various reasons, but certainly can't be understated their movement towards the golf cart as transportation, which I think is very fun. And again, another place I would love to visit just to, nothing else, just to see, to see what it's like. <laughs> um, well, I think that's about it that I have on my extensive outline here. Um, Hunter, you want to just run through some pluggables? Sure. I'm Hunter Shoby. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University, and I'm co-author, along with David Bannis, of two cultural atlases, Portland is a cultural atlas, and Upper Left Cities, a cultural atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. And of course, I'm co-host of this podcast. Yeah. And my name is Jeff Gibson, co-host of this podcast, of course as well as host of the YouTube channel Geography by Jeff, which, you know, you're encouraged to go look at Geography by Jeff. It's just sort of youtube.com slash little at sign Geography by Jeff. Uh, you can also find us on Substack. That's geography is everything dot Substack. We're trying to build a little community there. So there'll be some, there's some, already some exclusive content on there. There'll be more coming your way. Um, please go subscribe there. It's totally free for right now. So uh, it's actually kind of fun to, have a medium where I can just sort of write about whatever I want in any given sort of week. Uh, but this podcast also lives there. So check that out. And um, I'd say just on our way out, if you're listening to this on a podcast app, that's great. We, we love having you there. Or if you're listening on YouTube, that's awesome. We love having you there as well. Uh, please, if you're on a podcast app and you know your Apple podcast or whatever, and there's a little review mechanism, um, please review us. You know, we really like seeing that. I, I think it helps us uh, quite a bit. If nothing else, it, I think it gives me a little bit of a boost in confidence when I see another one come in. So uh, we really appreciate that. If you're on YouTube, please like and subscribe the, the, to the podcast. We appreciate having you there. Um, if you're listening on Substack already, great. Um, we love having you there as well. So until next time, we'll see you around. See you next week. <laughs>